Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Duncan and uh, today I have the was it the pie tag for you. Yeah, the pie book tag. Um, this was original tag from Josh at Liter Literary Gladiators. And I was uh, tagged by a Jack at the Rambling Raconteur. So thanks for that, Jack. And in honor of my flowery t-shirt, uh, my flowery shirt there. So hope you like that. Um, so yes, getting on to it. It's sorry. It's it's very hot today. It's been uh, we're in a, we're still in an extreme heat warning here in East Ontario. Um, I've got a uh, mint julep to try to cool me down. Extra water. Um, our uh, our ninety year old neighbour was very kind to drop over some mint this morning, so just been making use of that. And yeah, it's just very hot and it's keeping the, keeping the liquids. And I'm Scottish, so my uh, solution to everything is just, is just the drink. So. That's basically why I made some mint juleps. Mint, get mint, make mint juleps. That's, my, that's basically it. So I will uh, start with the tag. Uh, number one is Apple Pie, a work that praises, that sings the praises of America. Um, I've realized that most of the books and work that I have about America is quite critical. Not always in a, um, not always in a, like a bad critical way, and sometimes in like a, a loving critical way, but, um, don't really have anything that's like super out and out patriotic um, towards America. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Scot living in Canada, so uh, it's not not really necessarily uh, my forte to uh, have books that are quite patriotic towards America. I'm I'm quite obsessed with America though. But uh, um, so the closest thing I have is actually probably Encyclopedia of World Travel. And this is uh, this covers the whole of the Americas, so it has Canada, USA, Mexico, Central America, Caribbean, South America. But it's great. It's just uh, little segments of different states what they have to offer. So it's Missouri. Uh, it's pretty. I dip in and out. It's from the '60s, so it's also a bit of a relic. It's like not necessarily the America that exists now. So it's I also kind of love old travel. Uh, literature and uh, non-fiction books because um they're usually very good at taking you to places that don't necessarily exist anymore and like the, the way they uh at least what they experienced um and for you know some of them you can go way back and certain landmarks might not be there uh like imagine any travel book from uh for, for new york and that like predates the 1950s is going to be very different. Nothing that predates the 1930s. I think that what well, the Empire State Building was built in 1932. I'm not good. Don't quote me on that, but but yeah, you you kind of get the gist. Yeah, like there's certain landmarks that just uh, build over time. I mean, even this book here, it would uh, it was built in the 60s. So the CN Tower of uh, Toronto will be there, and that's really become a kind of symbol of Toronto from these days. So that's going to be. It's always very interesting to read those kind of things. Um, Cherry, a work that helped you, this sort of question to Cherry, a work that helped you develop a greater understanding of your country. So, um, uh, I'm kind of, well, I mean, I kind of have two to three countries. Uh, I I grew up in England, but I'm, I'm Scottish and I lived in Dundee for 11 years, uh, but now I've moved to Canada. So a couple books about Canada and three books from Scotland. Um, so hope to read this next month, but I've got the Penguin History of Canada. Penguin's histories are always really, really good. And um, this is going to be, I, I did read like a couple pages of this, maybe a chapter. And I think it's really going to skirt over um, the indigenous history of Canada. And it's really going to focus on the colonial history of Canada. And even um, pre-Confederation, it probably skirts over too, so it doesn't really... Won't really kick until 1867. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be good, give me a good overview of just Canadian history, and then I can kind of take that as a launch pad to see what I want to delve into more. Um, and then the other one I want to read next month as well is uh, Thomas King, Inconvenient, The Inconvenient Indian, which is, uh, and it's the subtitled is A Curious Account of Native People in North America. So it's really uh, more of the indigenous history of uh, 
Canada and, and North America. And it's, I think it's really going to deal with a lot of uh, the kind of the meetings of indigenous and, and the colonial set, the settlers as well. So it's kind of, I think that's why it's inconvenient and it's going to really deal with kind of the treatment of the indigenous people of North America from the white settlers. So it's apparently it's, a, it's, it's one of the, the books to read about indigenous uh, tribes in uh, North America. And then the books on uh, Scotland I want to read. I really don't know much about Scottish history. I'm, I'm terrible with learning about Scottish history, but uh, the great uh, historian John Preble uh, wrote some some great books, and I'm gonna have three of them, which are probably on um, the the parts of Scottish history that's probably mentioned the most in the collective discussion, especially uh, in the light of the recent. Uh, Scottish independence uh, vote of, what was that, 2014? So we've got uh, Glencoe, The Massacre of Glen Glencoe, and then got uh, The Battle of Culloden. Uh, so these were all kind of, they all kind of like, uh, Glencoe kind of like started the downfall of the Highlanders, and Culloden, and then the last one, the Highland Clearances, was kind of the end. I lie at the end of a lot of the Highland life in Scotland. So yeah, we're gonna read them. And uh, I haven't really read any John Preble, but I understand what he's really good at is kind of bringing the kind of people's history as lesser so than like the the named people and the um, the richer people. He kind of brings like a really great uh, humanity to all of the people, so especially with like the more of the working classes, the people that were down in the in the trenches, so to speak. So that's, that's those for a uh, greater understanding of two countries that I'm from, or I've lived in. Um, number three is Blueberry, a Blueberry Pie, a beach read you could probably finish on one visit. I'm not sure about one visit, but um, it might be a bit weird. Sorry, oh, I'm boxed down here for some reason. Um, I might be a bit weird in this sense, but uh, the type of things I like to read on the beach are actually uh, really massive tomes. Um, I don't get a lot of time to read um, during like my usual schedules, like when I'm working and stuff. So, like I work manual labour for like over 40 hours a week. Um, so, sorry, it's really hot, really hot. Um, and so. Yeah, I, don't, I, I work manual labor for over 40 hours a week, so it's like I'm quite exhausted and uh, most of this, I just read a lot of uh, uh, adventure novels and, and spy and mystery fiction stuff. It's quite easy to read. And uh, yeah, so when I'm actually on vacation, which is actually very rare these days, I like to read more uh, in-depth and grossing reads. So I don't know if I'd necessarily read them on the one visit, but I would probably read something like Karl Marx, Das Kapital, is volume one. Or maybe like a James Missioner, The Source, like a thousand pages. Or also I have uh, James Clavel's Whirlwind, which is set against the backdrop of the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So yeah, so I kind of like the big meaty tomes when I'm, I'm on vacation. I'm, I'm not much of a beach person either, so I generally like to Something that will remind me that I'm not at the beach. That's also what I like. Um, number four is Pumpkin, a work that would make for a great November book club read. Um, pretty much stumped for this one. I can't think of anything that I have that's like super uh, fall or anything. Um, <clears throat> not really much of a book club uh, reader either, so. Um, I'm not sure, in a book club do you want to be challenged or do you want something that you can have more of a consensus or something that's quite di divisive that you will have different views? So I'm not really sure, I've never really, never really done the book club. Um, I definitely, uh, I've read a lot of um, Holocaust memoirs so I think uh, they're difficult to, <laughs> they're difficult to talk about and di digest, uh, digest and kind of do, but I think they're important, so 
um, I imagine I probably would suggest any any Holocaust uh, memoir, probably. <laughs> like, I think they're very important to read. But, um, I'm kind of stumped for anything that's, like, super, uh, like, fall, like, super ties into fall. Um, so that's a bit of a, a bit of a pass there for me. Uh, number five is Pecan, a writer that does the best job writing about the American South. I don't know if it's the best job, but my two, two of my favourite authors that write about the American South, or perhaps stories set in the South, and are very much tied to place, um, would be Attica Locke. This is the second one of, in the Highway 59 series, uh, Heaven My Home, is set in eastern rural Texas. And uh, she writes a lot about race and how it affects uh, yeah, well, this is like, he's a cop, right? So it's, uh, or sh uh, the sheriff. Uh, so it's, uh, she writes about race, about how he's perceived as a, sh a sheriff who, who are really respected, but also as a black man who in certain parts of East Texas are, are really not respected. Um, so there's a kind of duality there. And uh, yeah, kind of about how his, his struggle with, um, his struggle with, racism and his actual struggle of being a cop as well and the there are some there is a real duality between his existence and uh, struggles and he's also uh what's his name's darren he's also an alcoholic or recovering alcoholic as well so there's there's all that that um even just the, her earlier works that were set in houston as well are really really great just uh very very good about writing about specifically texas so it's uh, and it's in the south so it, it, I, I think there's very few writers who write an all company about the south so it's very good to specific so but yeah very very good writer about uh, in, uh, in texas and then uh kind of similar but a little bit different because uh, Anna Clark is a, a black woman so this is a, a white guy writing about the south but it's uh, greg Ailes. he also writes um uh, very much about race um he also kind of explores kind of about how um he's very yeah he's very like i really really read natchez burning but he's very caught up in kind of like um the toxic nature of uh the far right ideology like uh Ku, Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy and white rage and how it's kind of like damaging to everybody it's having a toxic ideology is very damaging kind of to white people even though they're trying to better they're trying to like uh they're, they're kind of trying to uh, fight for kind of white people rights and kind of stuff like even if it, it's like it's but it's because it's a toxic ideology uh, it's it's harmful it's kind of harmful to everybody as well and yeah and how just kind of how it, it, it's really prevalent prevalent it hasn't it hasn't really gone away it's really right right about that and it's a very absolute good page turners and um it's nice to kind of have a little bit of a, a satisfying ending. His a couple of his uh, novels certainly satisfying ending. So yeah, I think he writes really. His his are set in like Louisiana, and Mississippi area. So I think it's uh, uh, of where he's like grown up and lived and stuff. So you know he knows the areas very well. I think I've I've never really been there. So, but as well as I've never been to te East Texas either. Um, but it it does feel like it's very much accurate to the place and the rhythms and everything so yeah there's there's two authors i really like about the american south but i don't generally read much authors about the american south for some reason i just uh yeah i just, I just don't read, read that much um sweet potato a book that responded to something uh what do i have that responded to something Oh, uh, I actually have a couple of books. Um, so the, the other one somewhere. Yeah, I think I misplaced the other one, but um, Toward Freedom by Tori F. Reed is um, really a response to kind of the uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders um, campaigns for the Democratic ticket in like 2016. Um, and it's, sorry, let's hold it up more. Um, so it's it's kind of discussing 
it's the case against uh, race reductionism, and it's kind of discussing about how um, the black struggle used to be much more tied than the mass struggle, and that um, it's kind of response to like how Bernie Sanders was more um, more harking back to those days, to uh, the civil rights movement, and uh, also kind of the policies, the more like uh, policies of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the New Deal, and how that's actually probably much more effective than say the Hillary Clinton trying to be a friend to black people um, and being quite cynical and just it's just a, a plea for votes and how actually um, just singling out the black struggle and not try, not dealing just trying to like deal with equality rather than deal with social economic factors of black people that would also probably benefit everybody is kind of a cop out and that actually it's 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 kind of just uh, kind of trying to like a little band-aid over a gushing wound. It's 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 kind of not going to work in some regards. Uh, I haven't I haven't quite read. I've read a little bit of it so far. And that that was kind of the basic thesis. That was uh, going back to kind of like the the mash like the mash struggle that would benefit all races than just to like single out one one race. I mean, it also argues that, you know, even though Bernie Sanders was doing policy, suggesting policies that were about the mass struggle, he also wasn't cancelling anything that benefited black Americans in particular. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, calling for an end of affirmative action or anything like that. He was, he, he realised there were some policies that you could still have whilst trying to secure the mass struggle. So, it's yeah, it's quite a it's quite a complex uh, argument, and it's kind of hard not to get like crossed over. But yeah, it's basically it's definitely responded to uh, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and uh, there's there's another book I bought, um, which was more of a it was um, this Mistake, Mistake, uh, mistaken identities by uh, what was his name Assad Qaeda, um, and it was more in response to the Trump election of 2016. And um, it, it also deals with like uh, how separating everyone, everyone down the races and it's kind of more of a diverse uh, action rather than just everyone banded together against the mass struggle, especially in the face of such a, a fas fascistic leader as Trump. But yeah, that would be that would be my uh, response to uh, a work who responded to something. And I'll put the full titles below, probably, if it's like enough time, when it's a little bit cooler, maybe. Um, so that was number six. Number seven is Key Lime, a mystery that you take on the beach, take to read on the beach. Um, again, not much of a beach reader. Um, sorry, I had to annoyingly put my books down here, and I put them all out of order, too. Um, I'm not much of a beach reader, um, again, but... Uh, uh, just thought highlight any any mystery. I mean, I could pluck any mystery book off there and it would read at the beach. Uh, but one I read recently is um, Laura by Vera Kaspari. Uh, it's just a naked hardcover, so it's not really that exciting. But uh, this was released in the Femme Fatale series that I think New York University Press put out. Uh, the feminist press that the City University of New York put out in I think early two thousands. And it's just a rollicking great read. Uh, there's a couple of different first person narratives that go through, um, slightly possibly, um, it's possibly a unreliable narrator, it's possibly one of them. Um, there's definitely a lot of written after the fact of all the things, but they're not divulging that they know necessarily as they're reading it. And at one point there's like the stenographer report of uh, an interview. It's 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 just really great and one of the best characters ever written in a mystery fiction. It's probably uh, Walter Lydecker and it's just it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm a huge fan of the movie too. I've watched the movie a million times even before I read the book and yeah, the book was still very riveting and great even though I knew kind of where it was going. But uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a great book of uh, kind of romance and jealousy and intrigue and 
yeah, it just keeps you keeps you reading all the way through. Okay, so number eight, Boston Cream Pie. A book, a work you would be up for reading from a non-preferred genre. So I don't really read anything like it's a cult or new agey, but I did get this from a little free little library. It's Nostradamus, Visions of the Future. And I think it's just basically kind of about how Nostradamus was right and how he predicted a lot of things. So I'll, I'll read this. It looks kind of fucking interesting. Uh, who's it by? It's by J.H. Brennan. So yeah, I'll read that. Don't read any occult stuff. Um, number nine, Macaroni Pie. A comfort read that can be enjoyed by all audiences. So for this, there's... Um, an American author called Katherine Pinkerton, and uh, she and her husband were both writers uh, for a newspaper, and in the like twenties. But then he was uh, diagnosed with stress-related illness, and so um, to combat this, they decided to live in the backwoods of uh, Northern Ontario. Um, and it's, they, she's written like three amazing books that just uh, describe their experiences of setting. Firstly, getting there and then setting up a home in Northern Ontario, and then um, the second book is about them uh, living on a boat in uh, just off BC, and then the third book is um, kind of about them traveling across, like down from Ontario and down across through America. I think they uh, live in Denver for, or just on the suburbs of Denver for. Right, low battery um, suburbs of uh, Denver for a few years. Um, yeah, they're all very great. But the the first one is is really where is the one I would recommend. It's Catherine Pinkton's uh, Wilderness Life. It's just a really fantastic read about uh, Canada, like just how to live out in the wild and how they kind of just like do it, just figure it out as they go along. And, they support themselves, they live off the land, but they also support themselves by uh, writing articles for adventure magazines. And it's just, yeah, it's just a really beautiful, beautiful uh, account of their life. Um, so number 10, Moon Pie, a work you can see yourself picking up at a shop with a drink. So when I hear drink, I immediately think alcohol. And I got my to go to for that is the Raymond Chandler, The Long Goodbye. And uh, specifically, the Long, Long Goodbye is probably my favorite uh, Chandler book. Uh, but specifically, it has a great quote about alcohol. Uh, let's see, alcohol is like love, he said. The first kiss is magic, the second is intimate, the third is routine. After that, you take the girl's clothes off. Thought that's absolutely fantastic. It's also a great uh, bit about had a, the a perfect, uh, perfect gimlet is half gin, half roses, lime juice as well. So that, that's how I make my gimlet. So yeah, that's really Chandler, always great. I mean, then there's another one actually. I do have another one here somewhere. Yeah, for more British drinking culture. Uh, again, 1930s. Uh, Patrick Hamilton, Hanover Square. Hangover Square. It's actually a really great. Uh, portrayal of drinking culture in uh, 1930s Britain and it also deals with like the specter of Nazism crossing across Europe and yeah it's kind of uh, all that kind of stuff it's a bit more comic than that but it's a great read uh, Pizza, a writer that does a great job with long and short works as well as thick and thin books <clears throat> so the only two writers I could think of that I really read that have done not necessarily amazing work in both short fiction and uh, novels, like um, because I think there's not really there's not very few people who ever do are able to do short stories and long fiction, especially like more your epic books. But the two writers that I, uh, that I've read that I've read both. Uh, long works and short works from them are uh, John Steinbeck and uh, Thomas Hardy and I think they both they do a pretty good job I think Steinbeck's short stories are probably way better but um, I did enjoy uh, East of Eden and there's definitely long passages of um, 
amazing scenic writing. I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do with the book, but it, uh, it definitely, it, it's definitely nice to read and it's very evocative. Um, obviously, uh, Of Mice and Men, I, I really love. It's a great moral story. It's, it's maybe a little too moralistic and, and it's maybe a bit over the top for some people, but um, I, I really like it. And I really liked it when I read that in English class. I was like 15. Um, and then Thomas Hardy, is, uh, his Withered Arm story is really good. It's a short story. And then most most of his novels are um, pretty good, readable. Um, and I also, I grew up in kind of Hardy country, or close to Hardy country, so I kind of have a little bit of a, um, more of an understanding of the kind of the area he was writing about, even if I was there over a hundred years later. Um, but yeah, that's some of the only two that come to mind. Uh, whipped cream pie, number 12, whipped cream pie. A work that is overwhelmingly in your face with its message. So for this, I have The Last Election with Pete, by Pete Davis. This is really like an anti-utopian movie, anti anti-utopian or dysfunct dystopian uh, novel. Set in the UK, it's probably actually more, maybe even more passe now because the level of, of what he goes to has maybe been surpassed by, <coughs> by British governments. But yeah, it's very like, kind of, uh, kind of governmental power and corruption and how they'll just throw it's it's satirical but uh, how they'll uh, uh, basically do anything to keep, keep themselves in power and kind of keep the masses entertained so they don't really uh, figure out what they're doing and stuff yeah it's, uh, it's a good read uh, probably read, read this again at some point uh, I don't remember it quite so well but uh Probably as effective as 1984, but no one knows it. So yeah, definitely worth a worth a read if you ever see it. Um, the other book to mention is um, is it Carol Kopech, um, or Kopech novel uh, The War of the Newts, which really is a fantastic read. It's it's a sci-fi move, a sci-fi novel, but it really deals with uh, fascism, uh, Nazism. Uh, segregation in America, colonialism, uh, imperialism, and, and and even parochialism, and just yeah, just kind of ineffective foreign policy. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, um, deals with kind of the arms race before the war, too, before the Second War. It, it's a fantastic uh, novel. Um, oh, and that probably actually that was probably more my answer for number. One. 13, which is American Pie, a work that does a great job using allegory. So yeah, War of the News by Carol Kopeck is probably, um, it's probably the work I would say for allegory. Allegory. It's a, yeah, it's a fantastic novel. If you ever see it, buy it and read it. It's fantastic. Um, and then 14 is uh, starting to wrap up. What is your favorite kind of pie? Um, for here in North America, it's probably like something like blueberry pie, but, um, uh, back in Scotland, we have uh, our own macaroni pie. It's, it's different from like the, the Caribbean macaroni pie, but it's, it's essentially a <coughs> hot water pastry, hot water pastry shell. So that's uh, a shell that uses lard and hot water and flour, and um, which makes it quite durable. Um, it's filled with macaroni cheese, and then you put more cheese on top and kind of brulee it. So it doesn't really have a, a it doesn't really have a crust, but it has like a a, a melted cheese topping. They're just fantastic, they're just and they're kind of ubiquitous across Scotland, and most bakeries across Scotland will have one. So yeah, that's what I would say for my favorite kind of pie. Um, and number fifteen is Pie Day. Who do you tag? Um, I'm not sure who is either you a either watching this or b. Uh, hasn't done it already, so uh, if you see this and want to do it, just do it. And then, uh, if you mention me also, I'll know that you uh, like doing tabs and I'll tag you in the future. But, uh, yeah, just do it. It's great, great questions and it took me a little bit of thinking to do this. I uh, hope you enjoy this. 
sorry that it took so long again, but um, uh, it's pretty hot, so I'm, my thinking is a little bit kind of slow today. It took me quite a while to even get the books together. <coughs> so I hope you enjoyed this kind of ramshackle approach to booktube. But anyway, cheers. <laughs>